What's up, guys? Elijah Shadley here, host of the V3 Summit Podcast, and welcome to episode five, coming out of the holidays. It's been three whole weeks since my last episode. Great to be with you here in the new year, and I hope that you're off to a great start in 2024. Today, we're going to be diving into the concept of gentleness as it relates to business and life in the community. But before we jump in, I want to pull up and read affirm the vision of the podcast. Now, I'm not creating content to build a following. I'm creating content to empower people to live out of their authentic identity. The world doesn't need more content for people to consume. I'm not creating content to eat up your time. I'm creating content to feed your confidence in who you are. It's all about emphasis, on the correct syllable. <laughs> Think about the majority of the content that you consume. What's the end result of most of the content that you consume? It makes you discontent with your life, your situation, country, your community, so on. You watch videos of, of the people who play for a living. It's all they ever do. And you feel bummed that you can't live like them. And you listen to political commentary and you feel more suspicious of others. I, I talked to a, a lot of, of ladies who say that they scroll Instagram for 30 seconds and wind up losing confidence in their self image. And most content is created with a value to get you to consume more of it out of a place of dis content. Here's the thing. I'm doing the reverse. I believe that we already have everything that we need right now as a Bozeman community to thrive. And the only thing left for us to work on is how to synergize what we have for multiplied returns on our investment in each other. And when you get done with this episode, I want you to be more content in who you are. I don't want you to consume my content. I want to feed your content so that you leave this episode refreshed, built up, and more empowered to engage the good works that you have to do in serving the people around you. Now, I believe that every person has good works that's tied to their identity, that stand out from every other person around them. I like to think of fingerprints as topographical maps of identity that we leave as calling cards in the lives of those that we touch. If you look at that little swirl in the middle of your finger, it would represent a peak or a summit on a topographical map. And being that it's located in your fingerprint, that means it's unique to your identity. There's no other person who has your unique fingerprints. So these swirls then point to the to peak performance or summits of success that are in your life that stand out from all of the other gifts and talents of everyone around you. So each person then has the unique privilege to use these personal strengths to serve everyone around them, to help elevate their lives in pursuit of their upwards climb towards personal thriving. As we touch the lives of people around us, we, we leave the calling card of our fingerprints at the scene of their elevated climb. Isn't that awesome? I love that I'm, I'm leaving my fingerprints all over Bozeman in, in people's lives that I serve from friends, family, uh, people in checkout lines, clients, drive throughs I'm leaving my fingerprints all over the place. I want to touch the lives of others to build a growing body of evidence that I'm doing good to all. Out of this then, I wanted to loop back around to a concept that I threw out in the last episode of courageous gentleness. I, I shared a personal story of how I was way out of line with a group of volunteers that I oversaw and how one of the members, Tim, confronted my bad behavior and called me back to my peak performance in leadership. He engaged courageous gentleness in the moment in that he didn't freeze and wait until I was done ranting, but he, he didn't overreact by fighting me and he didn't run away from the confrontation in a flight response. Instead, he stepped into and, and confronted my bad behavior and then invited me to go back to my momentum in giving good leadership to our team of volunteers. And I applied this to our community as a whole in how we engage people that come to our community to visit. Rather than backing off from confronting cultural values that, that people bring to our area that, that don't harmonize with Bozeman culture. My invitation was to step into these moments through courageous gentleness and confront them on day 
one. You can hear the full thought in the last episode, which I'll link somewhere here in this, this one. But the principle at play is that, is that out of a business mentality of it's not personal, it's just business, Bozemanites serve to approve of bad behavior in people that, that come to vacation in our area by being passive and valuing making money over safeguarding culture. And we teach people that visit the area that, that their negative cultural values and behaviors that they bring from where they're from are welcome and supported in Bozeman by just smiling through gritted teeth while we keep serving them when keeping their business. Then when people finally decide to move here for good, locals are upset because rather than tolerating cultural expressions and behavior that you don't enjoy for 10 days, and then sticking tourists back on a plane and sending them home, they're stuck with them for neighbors is for good. <laughs> Again, if you want to hear the full idea, go listen to the last episode. But the solution is to live a life of integrity that courageously flows out of one's stated beliefs. I had a, a sociology professor back in college who asked us on our first day of class if we thought that a person who says that, that they believe that stealing people's stuff, murdering, raping, and pillaging is okay, and then consistently steals, murders, rapes, and pillages without fail was a person of high integrity. Now, to a student, we all said no, and that's when he, he said we were all wrong. He was a good teacher. <laughs> he said that our answer was based on a misunderstanding of integrity. Integrity is, is the degree of correlation between one's consistent behavior and stated beliefs. Now, with this, he said that he was willing to bet that this person going about the countryside committing all manner of atrocities had a much higher integrity than any single person in our class. Uh, that's when half the class stood up and walked out, which I also think was part of his intention of his thought exercise. <laughs> the point that he made is that most people don't think critically about the statuses, roles, and norms of their social environment and test them to see if they agree with them, if they're beneficial overall, if they should be protected, destroyed, changed, improved. The rest of the semester was spent on him punching on our core beliefs and inviting us into a more solid stance in our worldviews and, and more integrous in our social involvement. You see a lot of signs and bumper stickers these days that say things like, make Bozeman, Montana again, or, or Montana, no vacancies, or this very colorful thought posted on the rear window of a truck that I saw here the other day. I don't give a f <laughs> about what someone from California f thinks. <laughs> these are certainly confrontive thoughts. That's true. But they aren't courageous. They're very cowardice, nor are they gentle. They don't value personal interaction or protect connecting with people, but they're, they're insensitive and inflammatory in nature. And that's why I wanted to press into courageous gentleness in today's episode, because I don't want to leave the sense from the last episode that the solution to helping nurture and strengthen Bozeman's culture is that we all need to be acerbic jerks. <laughs> Not at all. My friend Bishop, he quipped here the other day as we were chatting about these things. He said, a gentleman is never rude unintentionally. Courageous gentleness isn't rude at all, but it, it will peel your eyebrows back. My mom, she gave me and my brother a great example of what extremely courageous gentleness looks like when, when we were kids. At the time, we were, were living up in Townsend. And we'd gone with her to the store to do our, our weekly shopping. And I would have been around like eight or nine. And my brother, I think he would have been around 10. And she told us that we could pick out a box of cold cereal. And we didn't often get to do this. And we were, so we were taking our time, looking through all of the options. <laughs> As we were standing there, a man and his wife came into our aisle and things started getting super Tense. The, the woman was very thin, super pregnant. She's pushing uh, the cart with a little boy sitting up in the front who, who was probably around like two years old. And the guy was up in her grill, running his mouth, cussing, swearing in a hushed tone. And, and the whole time she was like dodging and 
and flinching and wincing every time he would talk, like pointing to the probability of more abusive behavior that was happening at home. And the guy was a hefty boy, probably pushing 300 bills. It had overalls, white tank top, trucker hat. And I remember me and my brother immediately looked down the aisle and we couldn't believe what we were seeing. This was so foreign to us. that We didn't even know what we were looking at. And from the culture that we grew up in, the only thing that we could think was this brother is about to die. <laughs> One, no woman that we knew would, would stand this kind of behavior. And two, the men in our lives would have straight up cold clocked some dude treating his wife like this in our community. We we're so confused. So, so we looked to my mom for her, some cues. Whoa. And she was standing there with her head down, like pinching her nose. <laughs> and me and my brother knew, oh man, mm -mm, mom about to blow. <laughs> This guy keeps running his mouth, insulting his wife, cussing at her, calling her all kinds of names, how stupid she was. Like, well, why'd you put that in the car? Why are you getting that? Why are you getting... It's ridiculous. And my mom finally had enough. She walks down the aisle, goes straight grill to grill with this dude. He's, he's about a foot and a half taller than my mom and starts cussing her out too, telling her to mind her own business. She says, this is is my business. I don't know what you got going on, but you are completely out of your line. You're mistreating your wife, being horrible example of what a man is to your son and my boys, and you're just being a bully. This guy absolutely blows his top, steps into my mom. Now, and, you know, my mom, she ain't want to cower and flinch. <laughs> she didn't start threatening the guy, but she did tell him exactly what he was doing. That was unacceptable. I'll never forget it. it about 20, 30 seconds of this, which seemed like five minutes. I mean, the whole store ground to a halt. Dude starts backing off of his tough guy routine and starts telling my mom to calm down, to which she says, I'm calm. But if you're going to behave like a damn fool in public, then we're going to have it out in public. Guy takes his hat off, starts apologizing to my mom. Like my mom says, you don't need to apologize to me. You need to apologize to this sweet young wife of yours. She's bore you a son. She's great, big, pregnant. Here she is shopping for you, and you're just being horrible to you. You need to apologize to her right now. The guy does, and my mom starts giving him the everything boy needs to know to become a man speech right there in front of God and everybody. I kid you not, this guy starts crying and my mom goes from, I'm a honey badger, I do what I want, up in his grill, to cons a consoling counselor, building up a man's self-image. Honey, you're okay. I'm sure that you're a great man, but, but you just never have had anybody step in with you and tell you you can't believe, behave like that. I know you want to do the right thing. This guy's hugging my mom, crying. And she's patting him on the back. He's got his face laid on her shoulder. She's encouraging. The guy wipes his eyes, puts his hat back on, huddles his family down the aisle, apologizes to us boys on his way by, says goodbye to my mom, and takes off. My mom walks back up to us and says, do you boys have your cereal picked out here yet? Now, come on, hurry up. We've got to get our shopping finished and get back home. Like, nothing happened at all. Sure, yeah, great, Mom. We'll pick out our cereal. Courageous gentleness. My mom didn't go all Karen on the guy. They hadn't invented that yet back in the 80s. But she didn't freeze or grab us and run out of the aisle. Gentleness is the appropriate use of force in the maintenance of proper boundaries through connection. It doesn't run away from the line because it's afraid it can't stand up to bad behavior. Neither does it jump across the line and attack people to tear them down with an increased expression of bad behavior. It sticks its toes right up to the line of appropriate boundaries and says, your toes stay on that side of the line. Now, the, the value of gentleness is protecting connection. Again, my mom went all sorts of honey badger wild on 300 pounds of bad behavior, but the guy was hugging her and thanking her at the end of their confrontation. The value of gentleness is for protecting connection. If I tell you that I'm a gentle person, but we never connect, 
personally. You can't know if I'm gentle or not. I, I very well could be, but there's no evidence built in your life uh, of this through appropriate personal connection. Gentleness is the appropriate use of force in the maintenance of boundaries through connection. Sometimes this can look like a pat of encouragement on somebody's back, or it can look like a stiff hand in somebody's chest. I affirm and reaffirm these values with my son, who's three. I, I say, we are gentle men, aren't we, son? He says, yeah, yeah, dad, that's right. <laughs> we have lots of opportunities to learn and practice gentleness together through consistent connection. He often asks me if I can snuggle him before he goes to bed, which I absolutely love. I hold his hand, give him pats, I rub his head, and we also then wrestle. And he gets to an opportunity to test his strength out on me and feel the appropriate use of my strength exerted on him. So, so from snuggling to wrestling, he gets to experience the full range of the appropriate use of my force and the maintenance of proper boundaries. And here recently, he went through this phase where he thought it was a good idea to hit his sisters on the top of the head with a toy hammer. Got really great immediate reactions out of him. And it just made him feel powerful. And I kept telling him that he could not do that. And one day, I snatched him right up off the ground after he just chunked one of the girls in the head again. I had him by both of his arms right under his armpits and was very intense. I said, son, is daddy really strong? And he nodded his head. <laughs> he said, if you and daddy got in a fight, who would win? You would, dad. Yes, sir, that's right. Daddy is way stronger than you, son. But what do I do with my strength? Am I a gentle man? Yes, Dad, you're a gentle man. That's right, son. We're gentle men. We're not violent. Can you be a gentle man with me? He buries his head on my shoulder and just hugs me and says, yes, Dad. And I held him. I gave him pats on his back. And then we affirmed together who he was through our known statements of identity as a family. Meekness is not weakness. It's power under control. And my son felt the intensity of my strength in a moment of confrontation and violated boundaries. He was bullying and controlling his sister with violence and fear, neither of which are welcomed cultural values in our family. A testimony of gentleness is built through the consistent use of force in connection with others. It has two sides in the full range of its expression. On one side, there are compliments. And on the other side is confrontation. Compliments and confrontation are gentleness in action as one nurtures healthy boundaries in connection with others. Courageous gentleness it's not all about confronting people and stepping on people's toes that step across the line of appropriate boundaries. Now, if this is all that you ever do, you only let people know how you feel about them with bumper stickers on your car and your truck window, no one is ever going to want to hang out with you. Again, this is just being a fault-finding jerk that's always policing people's lives, waiting for them to screw up. And gentleness, again, is the appropriate use of force in the maintenance of proper boundaries through connection. Sometimes this is a compliment, others confrontation. Again, with my son, I tell him when his hair is right on point or when I really like his outfit, and he started picking this up with me and will tell me when I come down the stairs in the morning, Dad, gets his eyebrows out, I like your shirt does the snappy thumb. <laughs> Thanks, bud. I, I really appreciate you saying that. Man, that feels good. He stares right back into his bowl of cereal, throws up a thumb, says, you're welcome. <laughs> Again, gentleness values protecting connection. And over time, consistent gentleness perfects connection between people. Being that there are equal portions of compliments and confrontation, then when there's something hard between people that needs to be addressed, there's a consistent testimony of the appropriate use of force that promotes clarity, honesty, and intentionality in things that need to be addressed. In confrontation, it goes both ways too. I was building Legos here with my son the other day and thought the walls that he was building could be stronger if some of the pieces were shifted around. So I reached over, I, I started moving Legos around, and my son confronted me, pulls his project towards me, he's like, hey, Hey, Dad, 
this isn't your building. You can't change things without asking. Boom. There it is. Building blocks of healthy cultural values. They're taking root in my son. If, if things are good, you're going to compliment me. If things are bad, you'll confront me. Gentleness is the studs built on foundations of trust that help create a pleasant home to live in. And gentleness it has the capacity to compliment people and to confront things at the same time. I once had a conversation with someone who was a part of BDSM culture, which if you're not familiar with, stands for bondage, dominance, sadism, and masochism. It's a sexual culture that practices forms of dominance, violence, and aggression within its practice, and I don't agree with it at all. However, in my conversation, this person told me that it's important to show special care for your partner the day after they've served you in particularly sacrificial ways. As we were finishing our conversation then, I told them that I'd been encouraged and confronted by some of the things that they had said and learned how to serve my wife better. They were certainly surprised and asked how. <laughs> I told them I was confronted by the fact that when I have to go away for business or, or to conferences for work, that, that my wife has an extra burden in caring for our kids while I'm away and sacrifices to help promote our family's welfare. So, so when I get back, I said that I needed to be more like this person in showing special attention and intention to take care of my wife and to help value and refresh her after these times, get her out for a coffee date with some of her girlfriends. Take the kids in the evening so that she can go do something relaxing, so on. I told them plainly, I don't agree with BDSM culture, but I have learned something of value in having conversed with you. And I was challenged by your behavior to love my wife more intentionally. Gentleness is equal parts compliment and confrontation that values protecting connection and seeing it perfected over time. Oftentimes, complimenting people takes just as much or more intentional courage than does confronting people. This is what I mean when I say that courageous gentleness is a core part of Bozeman culture. Practicing courageous gentleness with people in business and in life isn't a matter of just being a confrontational jerk and telling people that there's nothing that you value about them, you don't want to hear anything that they have to say or anything that they think and that they aren't welcome in our community. Man, it's this is just prejudice, judgmentalism, hatred, and the worst parts of human behavior possible. However, speaking the truth in love to people and telling them when you have a legitimate problem with their behavior is one of the most courageous compliments that you can give to people. It says you appreciate them as a person and value connection with them and want to see it continue. If they don't change their behavior or can't accept how what they're doing is not beneficial to you, then, then the boundaries of, of healthy connection, they're going to shift into guarded borders with regulated access. A principle growing up in a ranch community that's always served me well is that good fences make good neighbors, and the best neighbors have fences with a gate in between. Fences and boundaries aren't about keeping people at bay or out of your life, but about clearly marking the lines of responsibility where, where people's authority meets. However, if people are unwilling to take responsibility in how they interact with you, then, then boundaries and fences do take on a regulating function. As Simon Sinek, he has an amazing process that he employs to help promote positive outcomes in difficult conversations. It's wrapped around a memory device of A, B, C. First, announce that you need to have an uncomfortable conversation. And just springing an uncomfortable conversation on someone can often end in disaster. Is it sometimes jumping right in is necessary. Like with my friend Tim confronting me while I was ranting or my mom confronting the guy in the store. But where possible, announce that you need to have an uncomfortable conversation and get permission first. It would go like this. We need to have an uncomfortable conversation because I value our relationship, but, but there's some things that I need to address with you that if we don't deal with, I'm afraid are going to derail our friendship. Please be patient with me. As, as I stumble through it and I try to work through these things 
with you. I, I'm going to do my best, but it's going to be uncomfortable. Is this a good time to have this conversation? And the person, they may not be ready to have the conversation. It may not be a good time for them, or they may not even want to have it at all. So trying to push forward with it is, is not going to be fit, beneficial if they're not willing to have it. But if they say yes, when you do have the conversation, you're going to press into the B which is behavior. And this is going to include three things that, that you can remember as FBI. Feelings, behavior, and impact. Just like with the FBI, you're inviting the person that you're in conversation with into investigating how you are affecting one another in relationship. Relationships are two-way street. So you're discovering together how you're affecting one another. Let the person know how you feel and be specific. Don't just default to anger, pain, or fear. Be specific. When you told other people in our office the personal information I disclosed to you, I felt betrayed. So, so here's the feeling, betrayal, and the behavior, breaking trust, which leads to our eye of impact. I've enjoyed connecting with you, and I want to continue building into our relationship. But betraying my trust will definitely lead to our relationship failing. And it's important to stay in this place for as long as it takes to build connection and understanding between both parties. Avoid saying things like, you always or you never, because then they'll point to the one time when they didn't or did do that one thing, and then you're backpedaling, <laughs> losing credibility. After you reach a place of understanding and empathy, then you can move to the final stage, which is C for commitments. I had a mentor tell me a long time ago who's Name was also Tim. Maybe something with the name. <laughs> Don't confuse forgiveness with trust. Forgiveness is releasing someone from the responsibility of repaying you for wrongdoing, but this doesn't mean that you trust them. Trust is built over time through promises kept. Now, after you've engaged the problematic behavior and you've reached a place of understanding and empathy together, then you can move on into the C of making commitments with one another on how to transform your behavior with one another moving forward. And hopefully, that provides you with helpful tools to foray your way through the next uncomfortable conversation that you have. But you may be hearing this and say, that sounds like a ton of work. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do that. The alternative, though, is being a part of a community that's dragging you around to places that you don't want to go and living in cultures that you don't thrive within. Like my professor pointed out to me, the person who said that they enjoy a life of crime and then consistently commit crimes has a higher integrity than most people who say that they don't enjoy a life of crime. Integrity is the degree of correlation between your consistent behavior and your stated beliefs. Lots of people say that Bozeman's culture is dying and that it's sad. I would agree, but here's the question. What is Bozeman's culture? What are the statuses, roles, and norms of our city that are dying and decaying? And, and how do we nurture, protect, and perfect these cultural values to, so as to see them thrive, be revived, and then flourish with, without asserting them, affirming them, and confronting people when they violate them over and over and over and over and over. People are never going to pick up on our culture. Take it from me, a dad with four kids, eight and under, consistent affirmation of vision and values through the integrity of a living example is essential to building a known, thriving culture. Culture is more caught than taught. Final affirmation here at the end of some difficult information. I love living in Bozeman, friends. I've never been among so many people who are faithful to complement my areas of strengths and capacities and so faithful to confront my weaknesses and shortcomings than in Bozeman. It's amazing and is a uniquely beautiful culture. In order to safeguard its value, we have to be proactive in defining our cultural beliefs and then step into the consistent behavior 
of gentleness. Again, I hope you all are off to an amazing new year. Thanks for listening, friends. I hope you've grown in your contentment with yourself and your role in our community. Be well, do good, and I will see you in the next episode. Thank you.